What's up everybody? Today I'm here to bring you a new video and I'm going to be discussing the history of gender theory. So this is a discipline within feminist thought. Um, you know, some may argue that it's different, but you know, gender theory, feminist thought, they kind of go hand in hand and we can discuss at some other point or you can leave in the comments below if you want me to distinguish between those. But for now, just think that uh, gender theory is a branch of feminist philosophy. And so what I want to do is to give you an overview of the history of gender theory and how some of the concepts that we are here today in contemporary discourse developed where they came from. And hopefully this will be useful to you in navigating contemporary political discourse, um, discourse in school districts, discourse with your friends and family, etc. So again, I'm here to educate you on the history of this and not to, you know, in this video weigh any arguments just to lay out kind of the history of how this field of philosophy developed. So let's start with a crucial, crucial moment. And this is going to be 1949. So in 1949, Simone de Beauvoir writes her famous book, The Second Sex. And most of you have probably heard about this. But in it, she makes a striking claim that women are not, um, women are not born but made. And so this is going to go along with her main thesis, her main argument. Obviously, I'm not going to get too much into this because the book is 800 pages. It's a monster tome. But her main argument in the book is that women have become othered or they are othered, which is a Hegelian term. And women are really the second sex in relation to men. And so women's condition is made, in fact, by man. Women's very womanhood is made by man's imposing certain structures onto her. If you want a fuller treatment of that, go read the book. I'm not going to get into that. But what this line did is really, it was interpreted really to mean that womanhood is the product of social construction, especially the patriarchy. And according to Kate Mann, it's enforcement mechanism, which would be misogyny. So this interpretation of Beauvoir has been questioned a little bit by a few feminist thinkers. But, you know, that doesn't matter for our discourse because what has followed in feminist thought is the idea that a woman is one who has feminine norms projected onto her and the same for a man. So it's really this societal projection of feminine or masculine norms that has led to or that feminists have interpreted Beauvoir as saying. So a woman according to the interpreters of Beauvoir in the feminist tradition, a woman or a man is just someone who has had masculine or feminine norms projected onto them by society. And so another result of this, this Beauvoirian claim in the 60s, 70s, and 80s is that there is no necessary connection between biology and um, what we call gender, which I'll get to in a minute. So feminist thinkers have taken this Beauvoirian claim and basically argued that there's no necessary connection between sex and gender and that gendered terms, meaning masculine, feminine, man and women, man and woman, are in fact the result solely of societal projection of masculine and feminine norms. So that's really, really important to understand. This is where our contemporary notion of the sex gender distinction really has its genesis. And the feminists following Beauvoir's line in the 60s, 70s, and 80s went on to affirm this sex-gender dichotomy in order to get around what we call biological determinism. Okay, so an easy way um, to do this, to get around biological determinism, was to basically conceptualize manhood or womanhood as these social roles projected onto people. And so what this in fact meant for the feminists, and it was a liberatory move, it was a move um, that, was, that was motivated by women's liberation thought in feminist philosophy. And the goal was to get around, again, as I said, biological determinism. Because if you are biologically female, um, if femaleness is, is determined by your biology, then your destiny is really kind of already preconceived. You know, you are, you are biologically, uh, sex, your, your sex is biologically um, you know, however you want to cash that out, I won't, I'll get into that much later. That's pretty complicated. But essentially what, what, what occurs is that you are, your biology determines your um, social role. 
And so the feminists following Beauvoir wanted to get around this. They got around it by denying that, by saying that femininity is purely a projection onto the woman and the man. Masculinity is a projection onto the man. And so that's going to be the first move in, in, in gender theory that really gets the ball going. There's a lot packed into that. I mean, I mean a ton. You can really uh, pause the video, go back and watch that again. And so the other move um, that happened in the 50s and 60s following just after Beauvoir and in, in tandem with these feminist interpreters of Beauvoir interpreting her line, you have psychologists in um, John Money and Robert Stoller who introduced the concept of gender identity and gender role. These are extremely important for gender theory, feminist philosophy. And so you got to understand what these technically mean. So Money and Stoller argued or basically looked at their data and came up with hypothesized two things, gender roles and gender identities. So gender roles refer to what people do to disclose themselves to society as men, women, or other. Okay, and a gender identity is the private experience of that gender role. It's the inner psychological working of that gender role. And so the two concepts are intertwined. So these two thinkers, John Money and Robert Stoller, were working with hermaphrodites and hypothesized that such people have an inner gender identity that doesn't align with their outward biological sex characteristics. And from this, they generalized to the entire population and claimed that we all have gender identities along with biological sex markers. So that's how they got to this idea of a gender role and a gender identity. So that's going to, as you see, we'll see in a minute, play a crucial role in feminist and gender theory. So in the 80s, another lady named Anne Fausto Sterling, who was a, um, who was a biologist at Brown, argued that biological sex is a continuum. So she actually proposed five different sexes, male, female, hermaphrodite, and male and female pseudo-hermaphrodites. And her proposal crucially also included an idea of layered sex, that is talking about sex in terms of different layers. So for instance, one person may have male chromosomes, XY chromosomes, but a female appearance, but also male genitals. And you can have all sorts of these different combinations. And so Fausto Sterling basically argued that sex is not a dichotomous thing, but it's a layered um, spectrum. And so this is where you get, this is the, the genesis or the origin point of the, of the idea that sex is in fact a spectrum, that biology doesn't work in twos, etc. And so this sets the ground for this a radical plethora of potential sexes, or as Fausto Sterling Purcell puts it, an infinitely malleable continuum. And it also crucially sets the stage for the common phrase assigned at birth. So if you ever have heard this phrase, this is where the idea starts to originate. And the, the idea behind it is this, since doctors and parents can't see all the layers of gender, since they have to do with chromosomes, gametes, etc., it's possible that they are mistaken, and therefore they are assigning, not, um, they're assigning some sort of gender, uh, gender identity, gender at birth, assigning a biological sex, I should say, really, technically, at birth. Um, and in the 1990s, what you have is you have Judith Butler, and this is going to be another crucial move. So, so far we've got 1949, the 50s and 60s, the 80s, and then we get to the 90s. And Judith Butler comes out with this revolutionary text that absolutely changed feminist theory and gender theory forever. And it's called um, Reality, what, what was it called actually? Resisting Reality, that's what it is. Off the top of my head there. Resisting Reality by Judith Butler. Or no, no, that's, no, that's not it. That is by um, Sally Haslinger. It's Gender Trouble, Gender Trouble by um, Judith Butler. Gender Trouble in 1990 by Judith Butler. Resisting Realities by Sally Haslinger. That's a little bit later. Um, so Judith Butler comes out with this book called Gender Trouble. And in it, she argues that gender is a performance. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, 
Butler is operating within the tradition of post-structuralism, and she's going to argue that gender is, again, nothing but a performance. But how? Well, for her, her argument is basically that scientific and metaphysical classifications of things don't exist prior to language, but are constructed by language itself. And since there is a dominating power structure at play in the world, namely the patriarchy, this structure often creates such classifications as male, female, man, and woman. And so these things are not natural kinds in the Aristotelian sense. They don't exist prior to our language, as some sort of realist Aristotelian would argue, but are in fact the very products of our language itself. And so what she then concludes from this uh, with a little bit more argumentation, obviously, is that gender then is not a stable biological kind, but a kind of performance of a social role over a period of time. And because the terms are constructed, they apply these constricting conceptions onto the groups with which they are applied. And from that, you can kind of get to this idea of oppression. And you, with a little bit more argumentation, you can get to the idea that we should, in fact, not use such terms as man and woman. That is where some feminist thinkers do, in fact, go. Now, we get into some more recent stuff. So in 2007, we have another huge, huge point in gender theory, and that's Julia Serrano. And she really canonizes the notion of gender identity as a sufficient criterion for membership in a class of man, woman, or other. Let me say that one more time. In 2007, Julia Serrano, in her book Whipping Girl, really hits home on the notion, or really hits hard, the notion that gender identity, stemming from money, John Money, is a sufficient criterion for membership in the class of man or woman or other. This is the idea that your gender identity, your internal psychological representation of yourself, is literally what makes you a man, woman, or something else. Okay, so that is crucial. This is most likely going to be traced back to Julia Serrano's book, Whipping Girl. Maybe it goes a little back, a little bit further, but most people agree that it's traced back to this text. This is also where the term cis or cisgender comes from. And this term refers to someone whose biology and gender identity are aligned. Whereas a trans person would have their biology and their gender identity misaligned. Um, you also need to understand the kind of the dialectical moves that are being made up until this point. So I've pointed out Beauvoir, Butler, and Fausto, Fausto Sterling, and of course John Money and Robert Stoller. So Beauvoir, Butler, and Fausto Sterling have provided ways to try and get around a traditional notion of womanhood and manhood, which is going to be based in biology. Serrano and other feminists took this to the logical extreme, with womanhood not being based in biology, but in social projection, or now for, for um, Serrano, solely in gender identity, um, Serrano and others have argued that it is literally your gender identity, your inner psychological state, that makes you a man, woman, or other. So it's literally just your gender identity. You gotta get this right. It's your gender identity, your inner psychological state, that makes you a man, woman, or other, according to Julia Serrano, and feminists around 2007, and really coming up until now. Again, in 2006 and 2007, you have another huge moment in uh, gender theory, and that's going to be the adoption or the writing of the Yogacarta, Yogacarta principles. And so this was a group, this was taking place in Yogacarta, Yogacarta, however you say it, Indonesia, where a group of theorists, lawyers, politicians all got together and put together a list of 28 fundamental human rights for sexual orientation, gender identity, etc. And you can go and take a look at this if you want, but they start off by saying that sexual orientation and gender identity are considered integral to every person's dignity and humanity. Now, one of the most crucial points in this convention document is in fact going to be principle three so principle three is going to be really crucial for trans activism because it states that trans people have a right to recognition before the law. But how this is spelled out is going to be very important. So what this means is that trans people no longer have to have any surgery, hormone treatment, or changes to their governmental documents in order to be recognized before the law as trans people. This is going to be crucially, crucially important for developments in public policy and developments in healthcare.
And so these principles, while not internationally binding as law, have been adopted by many countries in Europe as being an authoritative text on human rights and have led to massive changes, again, in policy and in healthcare, as I have stated. So in the healthcare industry, to give you a quick taste, a quick example, the current standard is trans affirmative care. And this is going to also be in Canada, the UK, and a little bit in the United States. Obviously, states in the US um, are going to differ on this. Um, just to take a look at Texas, for example. But the idea is that, at least in Canada and the UK and other places in Europe, the general approach is to affirm the gender identity of any suspected cases of gender dysphoria and bring the body in line with that gender identity rather than trying to bring the mind in line with biology. And so this is, again, stemming from the Yogacarata, Yogacarta principles, especially principle three, in which um, gender identity is upheld as the definitive, um, the definitive, shall we say, point of what a trans person is, the definitive uh, marker of what a trans person really is. It's going to be that gender identity. Okay, so gender identity, your inner psychological state is going to be the sufficient criterion for membership in a class um, of people such as man, woman, trans, etc, etc. So those principles are really important. Now in 2008, you get another important move, and that is going to be the coining of the word TERF, or the acronym TERF, now known more, more commonly as GC or gender critical. And so Stonewall, the LGBTQ organization, released a statement defining, this was a, a back around this time, released a statement defining transphobia as the fear or dislike of someone based on the fact that they are trans, including denying their gender identity or refusing to accept it. That's going to be under any circumstances, even psychological, medical, philosophical, etc. And so this created and exacerbated factions within feminist philosophy. Now, one of these factions has its roots in the 70s and before with people like Janice Raymond. And this was labeled by Viv Smythe, a, a, an American blogger, as this was labeled as these, these factions were labeled as TERFs, or trans-exclusionary radical feminists. And basically what this means is that anyone who does not think that gender identity is what makes one a man, woman, or other is going to be a TERF, or a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, now norm, known more commonly as gender critical or GC. And so that is going to be another crucial move because it really, again, as I stated, exacerbated the factions within feminist philosophy and gender theory. So you have people who in the turf camp, the gender critical camp, you have tons of bloggers, you have philosophers like Janice Raymond, Kathleen Stock, um, you know, who else off the top of my head? I, there was a new book just published that came out from Oxford University Press you can look up called Gender Critical Feminism. The author, her name is escaping my mind. But um, those type of people, uh, other people, such as Alex Byrne seem to be on this side. And then you have people like Catherine McKinnon, um, obviously all sorts of trans philosophers like uh, Bella Rose over at Marquette. You have all sorts of these people who are on the other side thinking that gender identity is in fact sufficient for manhood, womanhood, etc. And so the last really big movement you have here is in the 2010s, you get the result of all this and you get an identity explosion. And so anyone who's been on a university campus or looked at gender options on sites like Facebook has seen an explosion of over 100 different genders or gender identities. Why? Well, this is the outgrowth of the view stemming from the previous thinkers I mentioned that gender identity is what determines who you are. So there are literally infinite combinations that can result in a gender. For instance, one could be trans for five minutes a week, move through trans phases throughout the week. One could be straight and gay. One could be a different type of trans person. One can invoke non-Western types of transgenderism, um, such as Two-Spirit and others from Indone Indonesia, etc. One could be non-binary, gender fluid, demi-fluid, demi-flux, etc., etc., all in very many different ways. And so the combinations of these things gives your gender identity really an infinite or endless kind of supply. And so, again, because these feminist thinkers and gender theorists have argued that all it takes is one's inner psychological state to affirm your gender identity, then in fact, this is sufficient for affirming all sorts of these different types of genders.
and gender identities. And again, this is going to be the result, the logical outgrowth of gender identity being a sufficient criterion for membership in a group. And also this end goal of deconstructing sort of a binary notion of gender. So with that in mind, those are really the big, big moves in gender theory, along with some moves um, in feminist philosophy, which is related. And I hope that can help you to clear up some of these confusing notions that we hear in the media, etc. And it can really help you to understand kind of where gender theory is currently and it can understand, help you to understand how it's developed. And, you know, I'm going to make in the future some videos explaining some of the terms that I've used. But just to give you a recap, we really have eight different movements. So in 1949, Beauvoir argues in her magnum opus, The Second Sex, that women are not born but made. And that sets the stage for biology and gender being separated, um, which really the feminists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s pick up on. In the 50s and 60s, John Money and Robert Stoller doing work in psychology and in the medical field, I introduced the concepts of gender roles and gender identities. And in fact, hypothesized these for the rest of the population at large. In the 80s, Anne Fausto Sterling argued that biological sex is a continuum, proposing five different type, five different sexes and the idea of layers of sex, which then led to this notion of being assigned at birth. In 1990, Judith Butler argued through post-structuralism that gender is in fact a performance, and this sets the stage for manhood and womanhood being a performance, not being rooted in biology. So this is going to be one of those different notions that I'll get to in a separate video of what constitutes a man or a woman. And Judith Butler is really pioneering this in the 90s. In 2007, Julia Serrano canonizes this notion of gender identity as a sufficient criterion for membership in a class of man, woman, or other. And so she's going to be, her book, Whipping Girl, along with other feminist texts, are going to be crucial in this respect. In 2006 and 7, you have the Yogacrata principles, again, that I went over. And in 2008, you have factions exacerbated in the feminist community with the term TERF, and nowadays known as gender critical. And then in 2010s, you have this notion, or you have an explosion of identities as the logical outgrowth of all this. So with that in mind, I hope this video helped, and uh, stay, stay in touch with uh, subscribe, like, comment, and stay in touch for more of these videos on feminist theory, gender theory.